Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We are now, we are now starting our board meeting for October the 15th meeting. I'd like to welcome everyone here this morning. At this time, I will have the invocation. If you would, please join me. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you that we can come here today and make decisions for the people of this state. And we've asked that you would be with each board member in our decisions and they'll be according to your will and the things that we do. We ask your blessings upon every employee in this department and in all of our people that you will guide them as well to do the job that we need to be doing for this state. And Lord, now we ask you to guide us today. Keep us safe for we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Now we'd have the allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I hope everyone is doing well. I hope those who join us with uh, by uh, phone are doing well. And now at this time, we'll have a roll call. Okay, we'll start with Director District 1, Mr. Self. Present. Two, Mr. Boyd. Three, Mr. Westmoreland. Four, Mr. Brown. Present. Five, Ms. Keith. Present. Six, Mr. Abel. Here. Yeah. Seven, Mr. Bowen. You here? Eight, Mr. Golden. Here. Nine, Miss Dunn. Ten, Mr. Bogle. Here. Eleven, Mr. Lewis. Here. Twelve, Mr. Grantham. Here. Thirteen, Miss Lemon. Fourteen, Mr. Sharon. Here. Mr. Kristen, I'm here. Okay, great. Got you. Okay. At this time now, I would like to ask for a motion on the approval of the minutes from the previous meeting. Any questions? All those in, fig in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay, at this time, um, I'm going to ask that Albert Shelby would come forward for the uh, report on the projects for November letting. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Commissioner, members of the board. I'm here to present the projects the department is proposing to advertise for the November 2020 letting. Before we present November, here are the FY 2021 results. We have led a total of 109 projects in FY 2021. This chart shows the number of projects by improvement type. The value of these 109 projects is approximately 292 million through the September 2020 bid awards with 105 GDOT LET projects worth approximately 289 million and four local LET projects worth 3.5 million. This chart shows the dollar amount distribution by improvement type with maintenance, bridge, and road projects making up the bulk of those types. Here are the results of the September 2020 letting. Of the 33 GDOT LET contracts presented to the board, all were awarded. Now I'm going to discuss the projects in the November 2020 letting. We have a total of 22 projects with 16 GDOT and six local LET projects. The next two slides list the 21 non TIA projects arranged by congressional district. As you can see with this slide, we are letting a variety of projects throughout the state to address bridge, capacity, enhancement, maintenance, and safety issues. The first highlighted project is located at the intersection of State Route 17 and Blue Jay Road in Effingham County. This project will replace the existing unsignalized intersection with a one-lane roundabout. This project will reduce crash frequency and severity 
while improving operational efficiency at the intersection. It is also an excellent example of our focus on safety. The next project is the replacement of the structurally deficient bridge on 1st Kolomoki Road at North Prong Kolomoki Creek. The existing bridge was constructed in 1963, 57 years ago. This is a great example of our continued focus on maintaining our infrastructure. Here's a ground view of that bridge to be re replaced. The next project is the widening of State Route 133 from just south of State Route 35 US 319 to north of Mike Horn Road from a two-lane to a four-lane facility for a distance of 8.3 miles. The project is part of the Governor's Road Improvement Program known as GRIP. This project will provide additional capacity while also supporting economic development in the region. The next project will resurface I-75 from south of Hat Creek to State Route 159 for a distance of 11 miles. This section was last repaved in 2006, 14 years ago. This next project is the replacement of the structurally deficient bridge on State Route 198 over I-85 in Franklin County. The existing bridge was constructed in 1962, 58 years ago. Here's a ground view of that bridge to be replaced. The next project is the replacement of the structurally deficient bridge on State Route 80 over Middle Creek in Warren County. The existing bridge was constructed in 1957, 63 years ago. And here's a ground view of that bridge to be replaced. This next project replaces the structurally deficient bridge over State Route 80 over Hart Creek in Warren County. The existing bridge was constructed in 1957, 63 years ago. And here's a ground view of that bridge to be replaced. The final highlighted project will install cable barriers in the median of I-59 I from the Georgia-Alabama state line to I-24 for a distance of 14.4 miles. This project is a great example of our continuing safety priorities. Next, we will talk about the TIA project. Good morning, members of the board, Commissioner. The T office is proposing to let one project in the November letting. Uh, this project is in CSRA of the Central Savannah River area, um, Congressional District 12 in Burke County. This project will be widening State Route 56 from Cates Mead Road to State Route 80. This project would consist of a little bit over two a little bit over a half a mile of widening, sorry about that, and widening from two to four lanes. This is phase three of the State Route 56 widening, so there were three projects in this bundle, and this is the last one to complete um, the section of widening in State Route 56 in Burke County. So we have 22 projects proposed for the November 2020 letting. This chart shows the distribution by improvement type. The estimate of the projects in the November 2020 letting is approximately 132 million. This chart shows the dollar amount distribution by improvement type. I now ask your, for, for your consideration for approval for the proposed projects presented for the November 2020 letting. So moved Dan for sale. Any questions? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. <clears throat> Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shelby. This time, I now ask for the commissioner to come forward to give his report. Mr. Russell McMurray. I understand Mr. McMurray was a little late this morning than normal. Sound like I'm in trouble. <laughs> my, my full name and have been called out on being late. <laughs> that is very true on both accounts. 
<laughs> Pleasure to be with you. Uh, We're happy you're here. So <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I'm here. I'm glad Mr. Boswell's here. I'm glad you're as chairman, Mr. Bowen. You're here. So uh, I got a, I got a information a little too, a little earlier, so I was able to uh, do a a different route. It's good to be in the know. Or I would point everybody to five one one as a public service announcement. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sometimes the truth hurts doesn't it uh, all right well thank you for that and uh i will i will conclude my remarks uh, about a similar converse uh similar topic so uh it's good to be with you today and as I always do let me start with uh going over our fund collections for september uh of 2020 uh, totaled $171.8 million. Uh, the breakdown on that was $159.8 million in excise, $12 million in fees. That brings year-to-date number, physical year-to-date numbers to $498.7 million, $463 million is excise, and about $35 million in fees. So as we compare back to last year, same date, same time, total collections, we're down about $20.3 million, which is probably not surprising. And let me actually uh, put that in a little bit of comparison and percentage information. I think it gives a little better comparator. Uh, as we look back to September of last year, this month's motor fuel collections were down 0.7%. Okay, so that's pretty positive, all things considered. Year-to-date motor fuel collections are only down 1.2%. Uh, if we look at the fee component, uh, hotel for September was down about 29% as compared to last year, which is not surprising. And vehicle, heavy vehicle and electric vehicle fees were up 36%. Now, the hotel fee is the bigger component of the fees, about 90% of our total fees come from hotel. And when we look at year-to-date fees of all fees, we're down about 29%, which is a little better than what we had assumed at this point in time. So again, motor fuel only down year-to-date 1.2% as compared to last year, fees down about 29%. And that puts us very, puts us right in where we thought we would be, if not maybe a little better. Uh, and as Angela presented the amended fiscal year 21 budget to you uh, a few months ago now, uh, is uh, we're, we're right on track. So that's, this is sort of positive. The other thing we're seeing is traffic volumes are continuing to come back. In fact, interstate truck traffic is higher than it's ever been, and that's continuing. And we're seeing rural interstates and rural state routes being very much normal. And we have now begun to see the urban arterials and urban interstates become to bounce back. Those are the ones that were still down percentage-wise more than the rest of the state. So we're seeing that. And in fact, we're now seeing uh, non-crash related congestion in the afternoons build back fairly consistently, still not as long as pre-COVID uh, pre uh, for good reason, and uh, we don't really want it to build back quite that bad, but it is a positive note that we are seeing a good bit of traffic uh, come back. So let me transition away from funds and traffic and move into employment uh, for the good folks that do, do all the good work here at Georgia DOT. Uh, at the end of last month, we had 3,734 full-time employees, 63 uh, temporary maintenance staff, we hired 30 employees, promoted 27, and had 54 employees separate from employment. Oh, let me, uh, it's moving into our procurement report for the month of September. We had 168 professional services contracts valued at $48 million uh, executed. That brings our physical year to date total to 501 contracts uh, valued at $238.2 million. And I'll just throw that number out there, 501 contracts. That's a lot of work, uh, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, let me highlight a few, tra uh, and I say a few, just two. Uh, we're trying to be very brief uh, in our meeting. Uh, two major projects opened to traffic last month. The first one is in Congressional District 9 
in Lumpkin County, which is GDOT District 1. This project consisted of building a roundabout at US 19, uh, State Route 9, at State Route 60. And if you're from that part of the world, you'll know that is Stone Pile Gap, is where there is actually a pile of stones left by the Indians. Uh, and this roundabout happens to be at that location. Uh, the contractor was C.W. Matthews Contracting Company. The um, project was uh, completed early in September. It represents a $6.5 million investment uh, to a roundabout that was very complex. Uh, when you build a roundabout on the side of a mountain, mountain it's pretty complex. <laughs> so a lot of walls, a, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, skill involved in building a project like that. The next project I'd like to highlight is in Congressional District 12 in Bullock County, GDOT District 5. Uh, GDOT uh, project was 10 miles of widening and reconstruction from a two lane to a four lane on State Route 67, beginning at I-16, uh, heading up uh, to the Statesboro Bypass. Uh, the contractor was Reeves Construction Company. Uh, this represents a $52 million investment along this corridor. Uh, this project was completed ahead of schedule and under budget. And I might highlight this project was sort of stalled out until the passage of the Transportation Funding Act of 2015. And in fact, we didn't start right-of-way acquisition until January of 2016. And this project was all state funded. So uh, I think that's a pretty good testament to build 10 miles of a four-lane road uh, from starting in 2016 purchasing right-of-way to here we are in October or September of 2020 open to traffic. So uh, a great corridor project. Glad to have that one uh, complete. Let me move forward and talk a little bit about uh, federal transportation reauthorization. Reauthor uh, as you know, last month we said at the end of September, the FAST Act expires. Uh, Congress acted and the president signed a, an extension of the FAST Act for one year. So that's the good news. The not so good news is that Congress only authorized appropriations through December the 11th of this year. Uh, so that that just gets us to then. Um, that means that we will probably have some challenges in our February letting of being able to move our federal projects ahead starting in February. Uh, as you recall, we have to authorize the federal funds well in advance of when we when Albert stands before you uh, today to uh, get projects uh, for your concurrence to move forward to bid. So we'll keep you posted as we look at that, but we're pretty solid uh, through January, and, and then we'll have to look at what happens for our February bids. So what happened in this uh, extension of the FAST Act uh, was basically – it also included good news, 13.6 billion added to the Highway Trust Fund, uh, 10.4 billion. It took 10.4 billion of general fund transfers to move to the Highway Trust Fund to keep it going. Also uh, transferred 3.2 billion of general fund money to transit as well. Um, if you break down the total uh, of the Fast Act for the year. It's about $9.1 billion that goes to the federal aid highway programs, uh, $14 billion general uh, fund transfer to, for airport and airway trust fund. Um, and also there was a suspension of the Rostenkowski physical solvency test for mass transit. Basically, that would have, uh, that was an, that's a existing, uh, uh, I guess it's a rule out of, out of house ways and means. Uh, but would have capped how much money could have gone to transit. So they suspended that so, so that transit could be made whole uh, during the year. Also, there's a few other things. They increased the multimodal cap for USDOT for a couple of their grant programs, uh, inc including Rebuilding America or the Infra Discretionary Grant Program, uh, increased it by $100 million and also extended the BUILD program, of which I just we just uh, gained the State Route 96 bill grant uh, last month. Uh, that program was extended also throughout uh, this phys federal physical year. So like I said, a little bit of good news and not so good news. We will keep you posted on what the short-term authorization means uh, going forward and let keep you in the know. So 
Now let me move forward to some, some other good news is uh, I'm proud to announce Don Diggerman as our new state bridge engineer. Uh, he replaced Bill Duvall, who retired just a few weeks ago. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Don. Uh, he is a registered professional engineer in Georgia since 2006, has over 20 years of bridge design experience. He's proven his technical abilities by designing bridges in Georgia, Alabama, Arkansas, Mississippi, and Tennessee. Uh, Don possesses a strong leadership skills and will certainly effectively lead the bridge office and also the bridge maintenance office. We forget about bridge maintenance being a big component of, of that office. So we want to congratulate Don. Very proud to have him in this role. He will do a fantastic job. And Don may be here. I'm not sure. Yep. Stand up, Don. So, the man behind the mask. This is what he literally looks like on, on the screen. So. Thank you, Don. For, thank you for being here and uh, look forward to your, to your continued leadership. Uh, I'm very proud to announce also uh, an award that our procurement team has received. And as I said, I'd come back to that procurement number. I want to congratulate our procurement team for receiving a, the 2020 Achievement of Excellence in Procurement Award from the National Procurement Institute. This is the second time that our operational procurement team, led by Mary Zyrock, has won this award. And to give you an idea of sort of how big a deal this is, GDOT is only one in 11 agencies in Georgia to ever win this. And we're only, and we're one of only five state agencies in all the United States to win this prestigious award. So uh, the, the National Procurement Institute began this back in 1995 to recognize organi organizational excellence in public procurement. It really, the award is a measure of innovation, professionalism, productivity, e-procurement, and leadership attributes in the procurement organization. So very proud of our team. I, I told you 501 contracts year to date. They do a tremendous volume of work, the highest volume we've ever done. Uh, do it very effectively and, and, and confidence and trust in procurement is just critical for what we do. So congratulations to Treasury, Mary, the whole team. I just appreciate everything they do. Also, uh, some other recognition. Last or back in December, I shared with you that GDOT's traffic operations team was recognized by the National Operations Center of Excellence by receiving an award in the category of best use of management of data to improve transportation systems management and operations. And also, we were a runner up for the Agency Improvement Award. Well, after the National Center of Excellence compiled all the winners, they looked at all the categories and now has named GDOT as recognized as the Traffic System Ma Management and Operations Award winner for the year for the nation. And so it's a great honor. We stood out among 45 submissions in reigning and uh, in, in, in garnering this Traffic System Management Operations, which we affectionately call TISMO. Uh, so uh, this is a very big award. We have received a lot of press about this uh, through non-traditional uh, transportation uh, publications as well. So you might have seen this already, but just again, I wanted to highlight the great work being recognized as the best in the nation. And uh, congratulations to John Hilbert, Andrew Heath, and, his, and the entire traffic operations team, which is a great team of innovative folks that really do a great job. And if you ever... Thank you, Jamie. And if you ever have time uh, or are interested, we can do it virtually. They can show you some fantastic things we're doing with data and, and how that really impacts our traffic flows and how it really can inform us about how to uh, manage traffic better. Unless you unless you get stuck behind a crash, Jamie, and call 511. So. Some things we just can't control. All right, so last month as I stood before you, I was receiving text about flooding that was happening across the state, including in Washington County. And we did have a roadway on State Route 24 uh, between Sandersville and Davisboro to wash away. And that was literally as we were at the board meeting last month. And so uh, I just want to congratulate uh, our District 2 team uh, down in Washington County, they had what was equivalent to a 500-year five, storm within 24 hours, probably much less than that. It was a tremendous uh, 
micro cell downburst in that area and washed out two sections of State Route 24. I want to commend our team, and this exemplifies, again, the, the uh, dedication and commitment of our, our folks in our, across this agency and especially in our district and District 2. We had 90 crew members work during the weekend. We had 45 members work. Uh, excuse me. We had 90 members that worked during the week. We had 45 that worked all weekend and basically had the road open in less than two weeks after the storm. And uh, that is a critical artery in Washington County. Uh, there was some other work to be done uh, with a local railroad that was going to close a crossing, and that was going to be doubly impactful if we didn't get the road open. So we were able to get the road open. And again, congratulations to the District 2 team. Uh, it truly demonstrates the very best of GDOT's commitment to serve our fellow Georgians and, and get the road back open as quickly as possible. So. Um, before I conclude, uh, I want to just throw one more thing uh, or one one more piece of information at you, and it's not a good it's not good information um, that I like to share. Uh, as I looked at our fatality numbers in Georgia this morning, we were exactly the same number of fatalities this year as last. I think that's surprising because you know how much traffic volume has been off. Uh, as we talked about at the beginning of this meeting, a big crash this morning on 85, six vehicles, two tractor trailers. We had a significant crash on I-20 yesterday uh, over toward Bremen and Villarica uh, area. Uh, we continue to see big and large devastating crashes going on, and uh, speed is certainly one of the issues. Uh, but I just want to remind everybody and everybody listening to this meeting and, and for us to continue to be vigilant and messaging for folks to s slow down, pay attention. You know, our motto is drive alert, arrive alive. The things that are concerning is that still the largest number of fatalities are people running off the road, losing control. And then the other really big concerning issue is 56% of all the fatalities thus far are not wearing seat belts. Basic, basic things. Uh, we just need to remind our friends and our and, and families to buckle up every time they get in the vehicle. Um, this time, usually, usually about this time of the year, we're seeing numbers down as we close in on the end of this calendar year. This is not a good. This is not a uh, a good statistic. I know the governor's office of highway safety recently got some good media coverage here in the Metro Atlanta market. Again, telling people to slow down and pay attention. And and the sobering part is every morning when you get this report, you have names in, of people that passed away from the previous report. And let me give you an example, again, about how important it is for people to pay attention. I'm going to give you the accident descriptions for this morning's report. The first was pedestrian struck by vehicle. Next was lost control. Next, lost control. Next, hit a tree. Next, lost control. Next, lost control. Next, hit a tree. Rear end collision, hit a tree. Rear end collision, lost control. Bicycle was struck by vehicle, head on collision. So you can look at that list. Most of those are lost control, hit a tree, or pedestrian or a bike. That means people are not paying attention. So anyway, I, I conclude with reminding everybody to please drive alert, arrive alive. Um, it's just that critical, and we do not want to continue to see this trend. Georgia is not unique. Uh, nationally, fatality numbers and crash numbers don't seem to be going down despite how much less traffic there has been on the road. So, Mr. Chairman, I uh, conclude my report and glad to entertain any questions or comments. Uh, Mr. Je uh, Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks for that report, Commissioner. One quick question I saw in both Albert's report and in your report, we, two roundabouts were highlighted. And uh, I have a very favorable opinion of roundabouts. I like them. And I was just curious um, if at this point in time, if there's been any data collection or is there any data currently being collected about the safety of roundabouts versus tra traditional intersections? If, if you have any comment or any data regarding that. Uh, yeah, I, we certainly can share that. I think that's a good information. We we put out that information. We're seeing good outcomes uh, from roundabouts and seeing those those crashes go way down. You know, basically you simplify the opportunity from a crash, and this number may be wrong, but at a normal intersection, I think there's like 64 opportunities to run into somebody. With a roundabout, there's only 12. I think that's the numbers. 
John says I'm wrong. That meant I'm wrong. <laughs> so, what's the numbers, John? 36 and 12. I stand corrected. Thank you. But but we do have we do have specific uh, information as well. The other thing is uh, the restricted uh, U-turn movements uh, that are going in. Also, we've seen great benefit with reduced crashes there where those have been deployed. Sometimes those are not popular, but the results speak for themselves. So, and I failed to sh click through the slides. I'm sorry. I'm, uh, here's State Route 24 to show you the magnitude of the work that District 2 had to do. I mean, hmm. you can see that was a that was no small feat. Uh, and then the final final uh, work product there. Uh, so we got it back open. So great job for everybody. Uh, Commissioner, I, uh, go ahead, Mr. Do, Brown. Do you have a question? Do you have a photograph of that roundabout? You were telling me it was very difficult. Uh, I'm sure we do. We can try. Okay, what, what, what made it so difficult? It's on the side of a mountain. So they had to, had to build <laughs> had to build wall had to build walls and that, that's why the cost was pretty high because you had to build a lot of walls to hold back the mountain above and, yeah. and the wall a wall to uh, support the uh, downside of the slope. Wow, <laughs> Gary, <laughs> yeah, I had, I'm just almost stunned that our gas tax collections aren't down more when traffic volume seems so drastically down. Is there any? Has anyone tried to figure that out? Yeah, we're, we're starting to look at it. And, and traffic volumes statewide, if you aggregate all our account stations together, is only hovering down about 10%. So there's, there's traffic volume about how many trips people take, and then it's how far people are driving. So we're seeing people begin to drive further and further and further. And so, uh, like I said, truck traffic is up. Uh, interstate traffic in rural, rural Georgia and state routes in rural Georgia is basically normal. It teeter totters day to day and, you know, holiday weeks, you know, vary, but traffic patterns across most of Georgia are very normal. Metro Atlanta had still lagged behind. And of course, there's a lot more vehicles in Metro Atlanta than there are in the rest of the state. But we're, like I said, those numbers are ticking back up now close to normal. And for a while, they had been lagging 15 to 20 percent down, those numbers are getting back uh, similar to normal. So so we're seeing those numbers be reflective of that uh, as well. And um, and also we, we're having, I think the, inter, the interstate numbers uh, are showing us too that there's a lot of through traffic coming back to Georgia too, you know, especially on 75 and, and, and the like. So. Uh, so we're seeing uh, good signs there. Uh, so that's po all positive. Uh, Commissioner, going back to your comment about the accident report and how many people are running off the road, is there any indication, uh, data, that what's causing that? Or is it messing with cell phones? Or is it just pure, you know, running off the road or what? I'm not sure that that's able to be determined out of out of the reporting we have. Uh, that you have to sort of take a deep dive into each crash report to see if that was a was reported in the data set that we get and that I'm reporting off of. I don't have that data. <clears throat> is there any way that we might advertise that more about what is going on in that particular area and what percentage of our accidents people are not wearing seat belts and make them more aware? Or do you think that I mean just a thought? No, I think it's, it's great, and, and, and Scott and the strategic communications team is doing a lot through social media and outreach uh, virtually now, uh, so that's how we have to, to reach uh, people, and uh, I know they routinely have things on Facebook and, and pushing out on other social media platforms, but again, there's nothing like, it's not like, nothing like telling your family and your friends, hey, did you know, did you know, and uh, please make sure you buckle up. Right. And so. <laughs> one, one last question. Uh, uh, go ahead. Uh, related yeah. to his question there, uh, uh, you also mentioned speeding when it comes to some of these accidents also. And, and I, I've learned firsthand from my young son, who's been in a wreck or two, that speeding makes everything worse. And I, I'm just curious uh, if you might know anything or have any information to share as it relates to law enforcement uh, with cracking down on speeding on our roadways and you know, if 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 that's been picked up or more aggressive or 
or if you happen to know anything about enforcement? I know just just recently, uh, maybe, maybe in the last two or three weeks, there was a, a big push for uh, speeding statewide. So uh, I know, you know DPS certainly is doing that. We we've act, I actually had some conversation with Colonel Vowell uh, a couple about a month ago on some of the things on, out on I-20 in that construction zone about getting some more enforcement out there. So uh, that certainly plays you know enforcement. There's nothing like the enforcement aspect to get people's attention as well. So uh, I think that's an important thing. Jamie. Well, I wonder if you know, the rumble's just not that you're getting right. I know we, some things are happening, but we're going to get more. It looks like that's a big beneficial people running off the road. But if you go to the city, well, they're not going to end up on the service. And there are things. Yeah, and thank you for that. That's that, that's absolutely accurate. Is that that's why we're deploying more and more rumble strips because you this data that shows that this run off the road. So anything that can get people's attention uh, is good. And so the the challenge with anything that you do, there's a big lag in the time you implement it. The projects that are being implemented today, you know, have to get built, and then then you have to wait on to see what happens. Uh, so, uh, as, I, as I tell our traffic operations team, we always want to be accused of doing something. And so that's why we're doing things like that. The, hopefully there's a positive outcome that may be a lag before we see the, the fruits of the effort. Uh, but that is very much a data-driven approach in traffic safety is what we do. And that's, that's why you're, you're seeing uh, last month or specifically, and I think a month before that, you saw a lot of rumble strip projects being advertised. So. We're trying to trying to counter that, Don. Hey, Mr. Chairman, um, uh, Russell. I know you mentioned Colonel Val and um, mentioned the Georgia State Patrol and I-20, uh, and that that re made me recall the accidents that we had there two weeks ago uh, in regards to our work zones, and uh, we put up, from my understanding, from Corbett Reynolds, uh, all of the electronic signs and everything else that was available. And within a period of about an hour, we had three deaths right there in that one work zone area. Uh, two of them happened to be Fulton County policemen coming over toward Augusta. And then the other one was a lady who got pinned in between two trucks uh, that was exceeding the speed limit. And I, I don't know what else we can do other than maybe extend the electronic sign out further, uh, but we can't control that driver in that vehicle. That's the problem. And so I, I just I just applaud what we do, and I don't think the blame should be put on our work zone people and our work zone area uh, because we're doing everything as far as I'm concerned uh, to to make the awareness there for these drivers in these vehicles. And trucks are part of our major problem. Yeah, that was certainly a uh, tragic situation. And, and part of the issue, and I go back to the speed part of that is, since there has been less traffic, people are used that they can drive pretty much at will. And now so what's happening is congestion builds back or there's construction where traffic slows because of the construction and people are, people are going faster than they should be going and they're running into what we call the queue of where traffic backs up from congestion, for construction, from another accident even. And that that speed and that speed differential is what's causing a lot of the issues. So, uh, whereas before, when when things were a little more congested and people were driving slower, you don't get the uh, the severity of the crash or potential fatality. So, that's exactly and that and that's exactly what was happening out there. Was people were flying on I-20 and then they came into a construction zone, even with the signage in the advance notice and the, and the flashing sign. So it, our, our job will continue to be vigilant and to ensure that we do everything we can do to warn motorists uh, and get that information out, uh, to alert them on the roadway, to educate them before they go, hopefully, and continue to message it. I mean, that's, that's still uh, our duty to be vigilant in messaging and communicating whatever's going on on the roadway to the driver uh, as we can, and, and, and sometimes we need to go back to, to your point and not only have the sign where we have it, but have to put additional signs in advance. Uh, we just need to be aware of that. So we'll, we'll continue to pledge to make sure we're doing all we can do. No other questions. Uh, Commissioner, thank you for that fine report this morning. Thank you. And 
At this time, I'm going to ask our Deputy Commissioner, Mr. Mike Dover, to come forward and to give us a report on the REBC grants, which means Roadway Enha Enhancement Beautification Council. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, good morning. It's good to be with you all. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, so I'm here as a follow-up this morning to a presentation that was given back in January of this year uh, by our landscape architect, Felicity Davis, regarding the Roadside Enhancement and Beautification Council. So at that time, back in January, we were, as a council, was preparing to issue a call for projects and to issue those grants uh, for those particular projects to those local governments. So I'm going to bring you all on an update of where we are with uh, those particular projects and those call for projects and then go through a couple of other things associated uh, with the council. So as a review of what uh, Felicity had given <laughs> and that is ultimately called in the code the Roadside Enhancement and Beautification Fund. We also receive contributions from any other fund sources and in the past we've received contributions from the Ray as well as the Garden Club of Georgia. So continuing on with the code as, as it relates to the Roadside Enhancement and Beautification Council, we have quarterly meetings and it's comprised of 12 members. Council is comprised of 12 members. The House and Senate Transportation Committee chairs, one member each from the Georgia Conservancy, the Garden Club of Georgia, and the Sierra Club. One member as a faculty member from the UGA School of Environmental Design. One member from the Georgia Wildlife Federation. And then four members from the Outdoor Advertising Association of Georgia as well as the GDOT Deputy Commissioner, and I'm currently serving as the Chairman of the Roadside Enhancement Beautification Council. The code, also, quote, the code also establishes a council advisor, which is a GDOT employee uh, as a landscape architect representing the department to advise the council on the roadside enhancement and beautification. By way of policy, uh, as part of the code section, and then we developed policy the REBC grant is a reimbursement program, a reimbursement grant. The project is installed by the grantee, and then at once that project is complete, those funds are distributed afterwards. Maximum allowable per grant is $50,000 with no local match that is required. And the government, the grantee must be a local government entity, have a local government partner who is willing to commit to long-term maintenance of the landscape. And I'll talk about long-term maintenance later on. We have a policy for landscaping and enhancements within, within the department on GDOT right away and those plans <coughs> that are developed for, for uh, uh, landscaping and enhancements must follow that policy of 6755-9. <clears throat> so back uh, in January, Felicity had mentioned that we have formed a partnership with the Georgia Department of Agriculture and we've established co great coordination with the Department of Agriculture uh, for Georgia-grown pro uh, Georgia grown products for our projects. <clears throat> and <clears throat> as we solicit that call for grants, it's, it's stated that when, uh, when available that those trees and shrubs used in the REBC projects must be grown in Georgia. So <clears throat> you should be seeing uh, on the interstates as you travel the purple cosmos that's coming up now. So the success of that color really depends on the weather. We've had more than adequate rainfall this time of year. So the upper pictures are current pictures of the purple cosmos and you all as you travel the interstates in and around Georgia you should be able to see these that are coming up. A little bit early for them to be in full bloom. The bottom pictures are the yellow cosmos that is late summer bloom. 
So these are recent pictures, and we planted these in and around uh, all over the state in the interstates, and they're starting to show their color for the fall. And, and uh, <clears throat> you should see those as continue on within the season in late October and early November. So our call for projects was issued and on January the 29th, 2020. We advertised that the call for projects through a board presentation, email blast with our local government email database, press releases, and on our website. So originally scheduled applications to be due by April the 29th, 2020. Uh, but due to the pandem pandemic, we extended that to May the 15th of 2020. And we advertise that again through press releases, email blast, uh, and again on our website. Some of the criteria for project submittals is a project description, a location map of the project, a site analysis, a preliminary drawing, a cost estimate, and a long-term maintenance plan. It's critical that there's an understanding of the long-term maintenance associated uh, with uh, roadside enhancement uh, beautification plants in and along our right of way. <clears throat> so we received 37 applications requesting a total of $1.536 million. We have three counties, 28 cities, and five CIDs. Pretty good representation across the entire state from the submittals that we have received. The average amount was around 41. $42,000 was requested, 16 applications requested the full $50,000, and then as part of the ranking system, 29 of those applications ranked uh, above 40 points in the staff review. So within the council, we established a subcommittee to review the applications. Subcommittee meeting was held virtually on July the 2nd, 2020. The staff conducting that were our, our uh, landscape architecture staff. And then those subcommittees from the council were Brad Davis, Dan, Dan Girding, Heather Lloyd, and Michael Reese. And then Zach Daniel, the director of the outdoor advertising, also attended in that subcommittee meeting. So those sub subcommittee recommendations were presented to the full council. We met on September the 24th, 2020. At that particular time, 12, 22 applications were chosen in the subcommittee meeting to present it to the full council, one county, 17 cities, and four CIDs. Uh, the average amount awarded uh, at the council meeting was $37,325. Eight applications were awarded the full $50,000. At that particular time, as a meeting of the council, we voted to move uh, those particular projects forward. <clears throat> So the next steps uh, associated with that would be finalizing that list of awards, developing those uh, agreements and notify those that were selected as well as those that were not selected. And then we will share those uh, local governments and entities with you all in your congressional district uh, as we pro progress through the process. So I do wanna recognize the work that has been done by our uh, landscape architecture team out of the state maintenance office, Felicity Davis, the landscape architect manager, Krista Grace, Sheen Chu, the landscape architect two, Buddy Sanders from the outdoor advertising manager, and Dorian Owens, uh, the landscape, landscape architect consultant. So again, we'll be sharing those awards with you, those selections with you all before uh, we notify those particular local governments. Mr. Chairman, I'll entertain any questions. <clears throat> any questions from Mike? Jerry? Mike, um, <clears throat> first off, I want to compliment what's been going on along our interstates in Georgia because I travel a good bit south on 75 uh, to Florida and um, I travel north into North Carolina a good bit also. But um, I was I'm just curious, and I'm not even sure this is the right place or the right, or you're the right person to talk to about it. But um, when you go into North Carolina uh, on, uh, I guess it's I-85, uh, it, it's like you hit a wall of flowers, and it never stops till you get to Virginia. And uh, we were driving up there. My daughter lives in the farthest northern part of North Carolina. And we were driving up to visit her, 
and my wife just after a few miles she's like wow it's like just everywhere flowers and i don't know if there's any collaboration between the states i just think it'd be a good idea for someone here to call them and find out what they're doing like i said i don't want to um i'm not trying to disparage our interstates because things look they look pretty good on down on south and 85 and all that but um i will tell you it, it was it was it was almost too much color along the interstates in North Carolina. So that was, I guess it's a comment more than anything else. Yeah. So I will say that uh, the districts, each individual district and district engineer um, developed a couple of years ago, a state line entrance plan, as you see, as you enter into Georgia and some of these particular pictures here are from our state lines. Uh, as you enter into the state, you know that you're in Georgia um, and then we can, you know, uh, that, that's growing seasons, a couple of growing seasons, and then that full color uh, after the after those growing seasons, and those those plants are planted. I'd like to also, from the board's perspective, is to thank our landscape team and the council for the great work they do in going through all these requests and these grants and the time they spend on it, to, and it does enhance our interstate systems and interchanges along the way. And it's like Jerry said, I mean, you know, when you ride down an interstate, you enjoy the beauty. It just makes the drive so much more enjoyable when we see the things that are going on in our state. And I like to thank our team too in, in the great work that they are doing uh, in that area. No other questions? Thank you, Mike, for that great report. Thank you. At this time now, our straight state uh, transit, um, we have, uh, let's see here, statewide transit plan update. And Trainer, thank you for bringing this to, uh, update for us. Good morning, thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Commissioner, members of the board. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide an update on our statewide transit plan today. We last presented about the plan to the Intermodal Committee back in December. So we've made considerable progress since then that I'm excited to share with you this morning. We're actually nearing the completion of the plan. The GDOT transit program plays a very important role as the designated recipient to administer federal transit authority funds to Georgia's rural and small urban transit programs, as well as administering the transit planning funding. GDOT contracts with more than 100 subrecipients statewide to administer these programs. Also under this umbrella is the um, responsibility for statewide planning, which is where the statewide transit plan comes in. Uh, we, we accomplish this role in part by contracting with MPOs and regional commissions as we oversee the development of local and regional plans. But the statewide transit plan provides a statewide perspective, plus it helps guide the direction of the transit program. So here we have the map of our, our current public transit operators in Georgia, um, the rural operators and the small urban operators, as well as the ATL area that is designated in blue on the map. The primary purpose of the statewide transit plan is twofold. First, it assembles all the locally developed plans from counties, cities, MPOs, and regional commissions, as well as the ATL together into one place so that Georgia has a single document to convey um, its transit plans for the future at a statewide level. And then second, it also objectively analyzes and quantifies the need for transit in rural Georgia and helps to determine strategies to meet those needs. So our planning process focused heavily on gathering input from existing local plans and local agency stakeholders, similar to how the STIP includes the TIP. The statewide transit plan includes planning efforts from our partners at the ATL, MPOs, counties, regional commissions, and others. We use this input along with our own analysis to evaluate current coverage across the state, to quantify unmet needs, and to, to develop future-focused <clears throat> innovative strategies to meet more of Georgia's needs. Very early in the planning process, we assembled a steering committee, and the first task we undertook with them was to develop the project's vision and goals, 
which in turn influenced the direction of our project and informed our analysis later on. The vision statement was developed directly by the steering committee and it reads, improve the quality of life and economic opportunities for all Georgians by supporting an innovative, connected, reliable and accessible multimodal public transportation network. Kind of a mouthful, but the, the key phrase there is for all Georgians. That's really the key to the statement and serves as a reminder that public transit is for everyone. Our goals include safety, always top of mind at GDOT, at GDOT of course, as we have already heard this morning, connecting rural and urban communities, leveraging technology and innovation, ensuring service coverage, and optimizing our current transit programs. Two stakeholder committees were assembled for this project. And please note that all of our face-to-face -face activities and meetings took place prior to the pandemic. It's kind of odd now to see these pictures with people gathered around the table. So I want to be sure to note that. Uh, the steering committee consisted of state and federal agencies and organizations with a stake in transit that have a statewide purview. The members were charged with developing the vision and goals and setting the direction of the project. The other uh, was the Technical Advisory Committee, and it consisted of all of our transit providers and agencies in Georgia that have a direct role in delivering or planning for transit. The members provided just excellent insight from the local level on their day-to-day -day experiences uh, as they operate transit in communities across the state. And since our technical, technical committee was so large, we also split this group into seven focus groups that are listed here. Uh, it included rural providers, urban pro providers, we had a group for equity and community advisory, counties without transit, and a technology group, and then a, a seventh group for the agencies that provide you know, health, education, industry services. We also have a project video. It's about eight minutes long, so a little long to share with you today, but it's located on the GDOT YouTube channel. It includes some great interview clips from our key stakeholders and provides a summary of the major themes and findings from the plan. It highlights some of the key strategies that are documented in the plan. So I, I encourage and invite you to access the video and view it at your convenience to hear more about transit in Georgia. Since GDOT's transit sub recipients vary widely in terms of size and needs, we did use a, a wide variety of methods to develop our strategies. Um, as I mentioned before, um, we had a very extensive local coordination effort reviewing over 200 local plans. We distributed a provider questionnaire, uh, held the stakeholder, stakeholder committee meetings, and also conducted stakeholder interviews to have more of a one-on-one -on -one, um, contact with our actual stakeholders to get their specific feedback on issues. We also de uh, developed a quantitative method for forecasting the demand for transit trips in rural communities. Last summer, we conducted a public survey, which resulted in nearly 3,000 responses from all over the state. I believe we received responses from 126 different counties for the survey. So using all these methods, we were able to better understand the needs of our transit agencies and uh, develop strategies for the future. So our strategies for the statewide transit plan do fall into three high-level categories. This slide has a lot of information on it, but it does provide a, a high-level view of the three categories that we identified as part of the plans, the plan that are actually overlapping and complementary. In the final document, each of these strategies is discussed in detail. Uh, the transit service expansion includes expanding to provide additional trips or new geographic areas such as the 37 rural counties that currently do not have transit service and also our small urban communities that do not have fixed route service. It also includes strategies to expand the capacity of our existing systems, such as expanding the hours of service that are provided, enhancing the frequency of routes on urban systems. And there was a theme of regional collaboration heard throughout our outreach progress process, so we include strategies to help Georgians cross the county boundaries to access employment opportunities that may only exist at, you know, when they actually leave their jurisdiction, which is very important in rural communities. Uh, transit service enhancements, 
These are improvements to existing transit service and include items like state of good repair, implementing newer technologies to include to improve efficiency and reliability of transit and safety enhancements. And the third item is the administrative tools and guidance. And these are activities that can be accomplished by our GDOT transit program internally or in partnership with others to improve on the services that GDOT provides to our subrecipients. This includes a number of toolkit guidebooks that would assist transit agencies with planning, FTA compliance to pursue grants and develop their workforce. So in the near term, uh, the transit program has identified a number of the strategies that we can actually implement incrementally. We're already working to implement three of the, the, the items that we have starred on the slide. The development of a rural transit marketing toolkit is currently underway in partnership with our communications office, who have just been fantastic to work with. They're helping us with a branding scheme that we will roll out to our rural transit providers. We took a bit of inspiration from Tift County. That is pitched, uh, their, one of their vehicles is pictured here on the slide. Their rural transit system is dubbed Tift Lift. Their buses are wrapped attractively, which has generated a lot of interest in their area about the system and positively impacted their ridership after they rolled out the Tift Lift scheme. We're aiming to use this technique uh, similarly to Tift Lift across the state to generate interest on a statewide transit level. Uh, it'll provide some cohesiveness for transit, but also allow each system to maintain their own identity. So we'll have a similar color scheme, um, a, a branding name, but each each vehicle would still continue to include the name of the county or the name of the system. So they do maintain their identity. The implementation of a state level mobility management program is also underway. We were recently awarded an FTA discretionary grant to begin a statewide mobility management program, which will assist us as we continue to um, coordinate public transit with our sister agencies, DHS, Department of Human Services and the Department of Community Health. We'll continue to work with our provider in the coastal area, who is Coastal Regional Commission. They provide our rural uh, transit, rural public transit down there currently. We'll be coordinating their system to provide trips not only to public riders, but we'll also coordinate with the consumers of the DHS coordinated transportation system and DCH's non-emergency transportation system for their, their Medicaid riders, so that all of those riders can be served under a single provider. Um, under Coastal Regional Commission using those same vehicles to really enhance efficiency and maximize resources for all of the agencies. The project also includes implementation of an app for use by riders. That was something we heard a lot throughout our, our uh, research as they really, riders would like a better experience and more you know, information readily available to them so that, so that they can access real-time information. So we are working on an app for that. And the, the third thing that we are currently working to implement is development of a transit development plan guide for regional TDPs. So this will be a guidebook for regional commissions to use during their planning work that will result in more consistent planning methods and coordination across the state. So give them some, some steps to use to implement actual you know, regional coordination ideas. And I'd be remiss if I did not mention COVID-19 and its impact on rural transit and small urban transit. Despite the challenges we're facing in the short term, we have to plan for the long term. Transit is an essential service. It's still running and delivering services and critical trips to employment, medical appointments and other vital destinations now and has been throughout the pandemic. Many of the trends we documented will, st will still ring true even you know, after the pandemic and during the pandemic. The aging population is projected to grow substantially. Rural communities' needs for access to jobs and services will only become more critical as the state urbanizes, which we anticipate will result in longer distances uh, needed to travel and an increased need to cross county lines. GDOT was fortunate to receive over $124 million in CARES funding, CARES Act funds to support rural and small urban transit in Georgia. We quickly stood up the CARES Act program this year, executing 92 contracts with rural and small urban systems earlier in the uh, calendar year, which provided the transit operators with much needed financial relief as they adapt to a new way of doing business, which includes 
you know, ensuring the safety of riders and drivers in, in new ways like use of PPE and meticulous uh, cleaning procedures. <clears throat> As administration of this CARES Act program continues, we're coordinating daily with our subrecipients to understand the impact that these, uh, the pandemic has had on transit and on riders, you know, from the operator standpoint as well. And we believe the timing of the rollout of the marketing toolkit is, is really is perfect because it will coincide with important messaging to the public about these extra precautions that have been put in place to ensure rider safety while they are traveling on public transit. Is there any question, uh, Leanne, have you, have you finished? Uh, Sir, thank okay, you Okay, thank much. you for that report. Is there any questions from Leanne? Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, this, is, this is Kevin over here. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I got a question for Leanne. Can you tell me, um, outside of the CARES Act funding, what is the approximate uh, budget uh, that GDOT administers on behalf of FTA? Um, it's about a hundred million every year, fifty million for our, our thirty million for our rural, and fifty-ish for our small urbans and planning. Thank you. Did, did you get that, Kevin? Did you hear? I, I did. No. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you. Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to commend Leanne and and the team and, and Casey Mertz. She, she, I want to call her out specifically. She's not here with us presently today. I'm sure she's online and she was actually in a few of those pictures and she did a lot of hard work. I, I just want to commend them. I think this is the most comprehensive transit plan we've done and an update or it's an update but I would call it a probably a, a rewrite and uh, redo and just again to highlight a few things is is they they work at record speed on the cares administering the cares act funding that came through FTA to us we had to administer that back out to those local governments they were in dire need so they did that in record time and that that is again a contract every time you do that that's a contract so uh, a lot of work to do that and then the one thing I, I don't want to get missed out of her presentation was the mobility management plan uh, where we're really looking at how to be extremely effective not only using FTA but DHS and DCH whether it's Medicaid or trips to the doctor to basically have a one provider system if you will uh, or one call system no matter what kind of ride you need basically the billing part of that to whatever federal agency that may uh, pay part of the share gets done on the back side of the or the back office side and and with an app you just get your ride and then with a few simple questions in the app you know ultimately the the money flows to the right place and so this is a huge lift uh it's a great i think we call it a pilot project but I see this having a really big opportunity to just make a lot more efficient and effective transit across all rural Georgia. And uh, and so, uh, again, they've worked very hard. We appreciate the partnership with regional commissions as well to uh, to look at things and, and to take on additional responsibility to coordinate things that have pretty much been very siloed over time. So, again, we're trying to figure out how to break those barriers down. Obviously, each each, uh, whether it's DHHS or FTA, has very rigid and strict guidelines and rules, but we're trying to figure out how to merge all those together such that the customer has a great customer experience no matter what the trip is. So I just, again, it's, Leanne had a lot of information, and I just wanted to make sure you're all aware of that great outcome. And we'll, we'll update you at some point to see how that's going. So, uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, and thank you again, Leanne, for that great report. Thank you. thank you. This time, I'll ask Tim Matthews to come forward. He's going to give us an update on the MMIP programs, primarily relating to the 400 express lanes. Thank you, and good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner, members of the board. I'm here to give you an update on the State Route 400 express lane project. Um, as you recall, this project is a part of the Major Mobility Investment Program, which has uh, several projects that are designed to manage mobility and congestion in our most congested corridors uh, throughout Georgia. And it does not make up uh, 
uh, only express lanes that does have other types of projects, such as uh, operational improvement projects with major interchanges, as well as capacity adding lane widening projects. So just to be aware of that program and this important project in there. Just to recall, the project limits uh, start at the North Springs MARTA station, and it brings two express lanes in each direction, north and southbound, uh, all the way up to McGinnis Ferry Road, which is a new interchange under a separate effort, and goes from one lane, uh, goes to down to one lane in each direction from McGinnis Ferry to north of McFarland Parkway. So that's the limits of the express lanes. And uh, we're also bringing ac several access points so folks can enter and exit the express lanes along the corridor and two different types. One is a direct merge type, similar to what you see on 85 and other areas, and also uh, direct uh, interchanges, if you will, or access interchanges along the corridor. And those are delineated on the map there via the colors that you see. But we're also bringing a unique um, enhancement to the project in the, in the form of express lane transit, as our commissioner has dubbed that effort, uh, by bringing bus rapid transit in the corridor as well. And that's really a, a MARTA effort. Uh, we will build the express lanes that will be the backbone, if you will, of the BRT system. But once we open this project to, uh, to traffic, day one, we will get an immediate benefit with uh, BRT because they will have access to the North Springs MARTA station as well as the Windward Parkway park and ride facility that is open today. So we believe there's an immediate benefit day one, even though phase two of the BRT effort is to come later on. Give you an update on the project schedule where we're at today. We've done a lot of work uh, dating back several years ago. Uh, one milestone that was significant uh, this year was the signing of the draft environmental assessment, the NEPA document, which allows us to go to the public uh, for a public uh, hearing open house. That really sets the stage for the last steps of procurement so we can get a developer or a contractor on board. And I'll talk about those uh, in just a few minutes. We expect the final uh, environmental approval, FONSI, uh, later on at the end of this year, early next year, which again gets us to the point of getting to financial close and commercial close on these projects uh, and getting to construction and eventually open the traffic. You can see the schedule for uh, construction start and substantial completion on the slide there. Just a little bit deeper dive in the procurement schedule. Uh, we're actively underway, in fact, doing some one-on-one -on -one meetings with the teams that are uh, pursuing this project this week uh, as it relates to technical concepts. Uh, we've done, we've issued the RFQ, we've issued the RFP. We're scheduled to issue draft RFP number two uh, next week, which is another milestone that gets us closer to the letting of the project. Again, NEPA approval, and then obviously moving toward commercial and financial close and getting to construction. As a reminder, uh, we're in the point of uh, restriction on communication. Uh, we've got a very sensitive uh, process here that we want to make sure that we hold true. So keep that in mind as you may hear from some of these folks. Here's a short list uh, uh, of the teams, uh, and it's made up of uh, a title team, if you will, and the names you see uh, highlighted there, but there's lots of members of the team. This is not your typical uh, project when it comes to contracting. It's not just one member and a couple of subs. There's actually pretty uh, high-level partners to help bring these projects forward because they're bringing money to the table to, to build the project in the form of a design, build, finance, maintain type of effort. So you have an equity member for each team, and these are just, there's lots more below these, but these are the high-level equity member for each team, a lead construction contractor, a lead engineering firm, and the financial responsible party bringing that money to the table. And you may recognize some of these team members uh, on here from Georgia. That's why it's important to understand that restriction on communication as if, if and when they uh, may reach out to you guys. Some current activities that are going on on the project outside of what I mentioned so far. Uh, we're in the process of uh, getting the InfraGrant term sheet executed, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. We are advancing several access points uh, at Tradewinds Parkway on 400 and Grimes Bridge Road. Those are interchange, uh, uh, new interchange access points. Coordinated with MARTA uh, for the BRT Next Step efforts, those are that phase two effort I talked about earlier, as well as other partners such as CERTA and ATL uh, who have a role in the project. I will require uh, right away early acquisition on the project because we don't want to leave all the acquisition to the developer uh, when they get to construction. Otherwise, they'd have to wait a year or two before they could start construction because they'd have to buy the right away. So we're buying about half of that, and I'll show you the statistics on that. We're developing intergovernmental agreements. There are several cities in the corridor that want to enhance some of the aesthetics on some of the bridge crossings on the corridor, so they're bringing money to the table 
to help bring some aesthetic features to these bridges that we have to replace because of express lanes, and, and we're in the process of executing those. And obviously, we're in the procurement process to get that developer on board. Right-of-way acquisition status, there's about a little over 200 parcels that are uh, affected or impacted that we need some sort of right-of-way or easement from on the corridor, which includes the BRT effort that we're not precluding for MARTA in the phase two effort. There's 100 uh, contracts, if you will, underway to get those parcels, or, uh, not 100 contracts, 100 parcels that are uh, actively being pursued for early acquisition. We've acquired 42 out of those 100 uh, and just general acquisition for the bus rapid transit influence acquisitions. Those are those bulb out areas for the future stations. Uh, there's 38 plus or minus potential impacted properties and we've acquired 13 of those in those areas. An update on the funding status for the project. As I mentioned, this is not your normal project. We are uh, design bill finance, so finance elements to this project. So we did receive a favorable uh, approval of a PABS allocation, a private activity bond, and that's basically tax exempt bonds issued by or on behalf of the state and local government for the purpose of providing special financing benefit, benefits for qualified projects. So that's a significant win, if you will. We requested a little over 500 million in allocation and we received that amount. So that was a very nice win for the project. Uh, we're also in the process of uh, working on TIFIA loan uh, for the project. That's Transportation Infrastructure Finance and, Invest and Innovation Act. And that provides credit assistance for qualified projects for regional and national significance. And we're in the process of working on that term sheet uh, with the Build America Bureau uh, right now. And then finally, as far as funding is concerned, uh, if you may recall, we did receive an infra grant uh, and that was in the tune of $184 million for this project uh, several years ago. And we're in the process of getting that term sheet approved with FHWA and USDOT as well. So as I mentioned, the environmental assessment was approved, which allowed us to go to the public uh, for our final round of public hearing open house uh, on the project. We obviously had to do that virtually because of the pandemic, but we thought it was quite successful in the fact that we did a virtual platform to advertise the current activity on the project and receive more importantly, the comments that we need to help make the best decisions we can moving the project forward. And it, these are numbers I, I don't think I've ever seen before. I've done many, many public information meetings and you typically in the range of, you know, several hundred to maybe up to a thousand or so, but because of the virtual platform, we've been able to get uh, about 7,400 plus visitors to the platform to view the project and what's going on with it, which I think is tremendous, tremendously successful. And we've received a lot of praise from FHWA when our efforts with, this, with regards to our effort to get the message out on the project. We obviously received comments uh, uh, on the project, well over 100, and we're in the process of responding to those right now. Again, leading us to the final approval of the environmental document. With that, uh, I will open it up for any questions you may have. So any questions for, for Tim, uh, Jamie? Well, the design and construction cost is about $1.3 billion is the estimated cost for that. Obviously there's finance costs tied to that, which would take you up to around three, a little over 3 billion, but uh, it's a 35 year payback period, uh, which is how this project's set up. Are there any other questions for Tim regarding this update? Thank you, Tim, for that report. It was very enlightening, and we thank you for your hard work and commitment to this project. Thank you. At this time, we have some board action items we need to take care of this morning, please. And I would like for Mark Mastonardi to come up and to give us um, a uh, information on the bidding of uh, the uh, big, uh, the protest uh, rule, the bid protest rule is gonna be the first one. Yes, sir. Good morning, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, commissioner. I do come before you today to ask for your favorable consideration to open the board rules for public comment for the addition of a bid protest rule. Uh, in last legislative session, there was a piece of legislation that ultimately came through in House Bill 1098 that amended the code section 32-269 with this part F. And if you'll bear with me, I'll read that verbatim. It says the department shall provide by rule and regulation for a procedure to appeal the rejection of any bid for contracts the department is authorized to enter into under this code section. 
Uh, I'll also share with you in the four and a half plus years as the director of construction, I can recount one time where the lettering results of a project were disputed. I can go back additionally to my period in the state construction office involved with estimating committee and bid review. Back to 2010, I can't recall another example. So this is quite a rare occasion. But I'll also say that in the event that did occur, we went through that process in an ad hoc manner. So to actually develop a formalized process that spells out rules of engagement, if you will, and give some expe expectation management is certainly something we benefit from. Uh, so we've endeavored to undertake this charge and put this forward. Uh, in respect of your time, the, the entire the entirety of the rule was provided in the board mail out. So I'm not gonna go over all of that with you. I do, however, wanna speak to the three highlighted pieces that are here uh, in, in, in a little bit. Uh, but I first want to cover the two that aren't highlighted. They're very easy to explain. The definition section is what you might imagine. It's simply the def definition of the terms to be applied through the balance of the rule. The important one here is the withholding of the award. So if I make a football analogy, the bid protest is a flag on the play. Understand at that moment in time, I've identified an apparent low bidder. And rather than entangle the agency in that contractor in a contractual relationship, we're gonna, pass, we're gonna press pause to that administrative action of awarding a project. So it's important to understand that this does delay to some extent the execution and award of work. So I do wanna spend a little time on these other three. And the first, this is an excerpt of the section regarding eligibility to file bid protest. It's our understanding from the, the bill's authors and some input of the highway contracting industry, there was concern that we didn't want this process to invite unnecessary protest that would delay the work. Uh, and we support that and we agree with that. And in fact, what we've identified is the people that should be able to have standing for these matters are those that would otherwise have the lowest bid. Um, so the first example of that uh, I'll, I will provide, it's a bidder who has not been identified as the apparent low bidder for a project whose bid is lower than that of the apparent low bidder. I'll be the first to say that is a, uh, that's a calorie pack sentence. So let me, let, me, let me back up and explain that a little bit. So on the day of the letting, and this occurs in electronic application on the internet, the results are posted ranked from the lowest bidder to the highest. There is the potential, let me say there were five bidders to a project and only four of the results are posted. That is the potential for this to occur and that is that example that, uh, that is given. And the reason for that could be say DBE goals. If we establish a requirement for a 15% DBE goal, you submit your bid and you only show support for 10% of that goal, you're gonna be deemed non-responsive to the advertisement. And we're not gonna give your bid additional consideration. That's an example of where this would be applicable. Another is where there's a failure to provide a valid bid bond. So again, these, in these scenarios, advancing that consideration doesn't exist. You may hold that low bid, nobody knows you're there. Uh, the second scenario is a little bit easier to explain, but nonetheless, we'll, we'll warrant some explanation. And that's where an apparent low bidder is not actually awarded the project. So in our letting process, we have the letting on that Friday, you've identified an apparent low bidder. It's purposeful that you use the word apparent. Subsequent to the letting, there are some submittals that must occur, review of the estimate, or excuse me, review of the bid. Uh, it's possible that in that period, there's a submission uh, regarding E-Verify, that you're gonna comply with the immigration and security requirements. If you fail to submit that, we're gonna move on to that second bidder and see if there's potential to award the project to that individual. Uh, similarly, sticking with the DBE example I gave you, not only do you mathematically have to provide that support at the time of the letting, after the letting, you have to provide commitment letters in the amount of that DBE goal. So failure to provide that would necessarily stop consideration of your bid. So those are your two examples where you may have a low bidder out there that wants to have and deserves to have an opportunity to come forward, uh, express their desire for additional consideration. We did feel it was important though to bookend this with a couple scenarios where we would not entertain a bid protest. And the first of those two are where we reject all bids. Clear example is where those, those bids come in in excess of our estimate we don't have the money available to apply to the project. It wouldn't be fruitful to gather and discuss anybody's bid. Uh, the second scenario where we wanna reserve discretion, if there's an emergency contract, 
that occurs through the bidding administration office. It's in the interest of public welfare or safety. We want to be able to not delay that work and get that underway expeditiously. So we reserve the right to say we wouldn't allow a protest of that result either. So that's very quickly the eligibility uh, to engage in a protest. In, in concert with that, we, we develop the necessary forms and procedure to do so. Uh, the filing of the bid protest actually utilizes forms that are fill-in forms that identify the what and the why. What is it that, you're, that you want to protest? You're going to demonstrate this to us. You make your request. Uh, it must be received within 72 hours of the posting of these, the information on the results, um, excluding weekends and holidays. But it's also accompanied with a bond. And this is quite a common feature in other uh, agency protest processes, uh, whereby when this happens, this is essentially an all hands on deck moment for the agency. You've immediately engaged your Office of General Counsel. You're likely going to have your executive staff and senior staff be members of this board of review that is going to hear this concern. Uh, so there's a bond value associated with it. And I'll give you those, those numbers. Uh, a bid amount up to $500,000, that's a $1,000 bond. A bid amount from $500,001 to a million dollars, that's a $2,000 bond. For a bid amount in excess of a million, it's a half a percent of the contract, not to exceed $15,000. So again, these are, these are fairly common approaches to this, uh, to the submission. So we also established what we think is an aggressive uh, but achievable timeline to do this. Again, keep in mind, we pressed pause on the award execution of a project and delayed that activity. Uh, so we've established that within 14 days of that notice, we're going to have an informal hearing. This is my opportunity to give you a bright spot for the day. I want you to conceive a post-COVID environment. It'll be in this room. There'll be no masks. We can all be shoulder to shoulder. That'd be a great day when that happens. But nonetheless, that hearing will occur, and that entity will come forward and give all their information and why they believe they deserve additional consideration. And we will, we will have that hearing and within five days of that hearing, we will issue a preliminary finding uh, as for that issue. If that entity doesn't prevail and wants to press their appeal further, they may and request a formal hearing that would occur. Again, in that same time frame, that's a uh, three-day notification, 14 days to have that hearing, five days to give that final formal result. Um, this is this is a matter of really looking at it on on, a, on the long period of time saying we hope we can resolve this matter in somewhere under two and a half months. Uh, with that, I will pause and ask if there's any questions to what I've provided here. Is there any questions for Mark? Um, if right. not, so then go, you will go ahead and ask for board approval yes, on sir. opening the rules. Correct, sir. That, that, that is my request is that I ask for your consideration for a motion uh, and an uh, and action to open the board rules to be posted in accordance with the Secretary of State's office for, for a period of 30 days for comment, and that would expire on November 16th. All right, uh, we have a, a, an a approval and, and a second. Is there any other questions? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Motion aye. carries. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. I'll ask John Hippard now if he will come forward to deal with the automa automated speed zones in school zones. Is that correct? That is correct. Ladies and gentlemen of the board, Commissioner, good morning. I am here on a brief item, but I confess I'm going to interrupt myself very briefly. Um, I thought I was doing good earlier in this meeting, Mr. Lewis, as you asked a question about roundabout crash experience. Um, that I pass that off to our traffic ops staff so they, it, they could get it in their workload and work plan. But then I forgot how good they were, as, as the commissioner made mention earlier today. I already have an answer. So um, they did a study of roundabouts, of our experience with roundabouts, a sample of them, not all of them, because we have 230 roundabouts statewide. But what we found out was that we've identified a 57% reduction in the property damage type of crashes and an 80% reduction in the injury and fatality type crashes.
crashes, 80 percent um, in these that they they looked at. So you, you sum you sum all that up, and you get to a 64 percent reduction, all types of crashes. But the 80 percent of injury and fatality sure gets my attention. So my apologies for interrupting the flow of the meeting, but I, but I thought it germane and relevant. So my purpose before you this morning is to request that the board rules be opened to update the rules pertaining to automated speed zone enforcement in school zones, which is chapter 672.20. What we're doing is in response to feedback that we have received. How we got here, in, uh, in 2018, state law was passed that directed the department to develop rules concerning the implementation and operation of these devices. And we did so. Those were adopted in August of 2018. Um, the changes we've proposed, we propose, and you have them before you in synopsis and then in also markup of the actual um, rule, will simplify the application process for local roads and streets, which is the overwhelming majority of the places where these would most likely be installed. Um, and it also will empower local governments to have a more active role in the process, backing off some of the bureaucracy that we were requiring of them, but also letting them own more practically of the process. So that's all we're doing in it. You can see the, the edits as before you there. And so um, similar to what you just heard from Mr. Mastronardi, uh, I am asking if you, for any questions you may have concerning this, and absent those, would then ask for your approval to open the board rules and post the draft for public comment with the deadline of November 16th, 2020, same as you just heard from Mr. Master. Is there any questions from John regarding this action request? If not, we'll have a motion to open the board rules. So we have a second. Okay, if there's no other questions, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Motion aye. approved. Aye. Motion is approved. Thank you, John. Thank, Thank you, you for your much. good work and your great and operations. And incidentally, John is head of operations. If any other business to come before this board, if not, we'll have a motion to dismiss. We have dismissed.